today we continue our series, Male and Female. In the first two weeks, we dealt primarily about the role male and female in marriage, okay? The relationship in marriage. And last week, we shifted towards male and female in the church. And if you missed last week, I would really encourage you to go online and listen to it. It's just going to help a lot, set the table for what we're talking about today. If you're just coming into it today, you're going to feel like some questions aren't answered or some things were skipped, okay? And so I'd encourage you to go online and listen to that. But we're doing this short series, Male and Female, um, in, in part because a culture that believes that men can be women and women can be men, vice versa, that they're just interchangeable, is a culture that has no answers for what ails us, and a culture that is hopelessly lost, and a culture that is taking people that want answers, that want help, and giving them the opposite of that help. Um, we even have, even recently here, candidates for major political office publicly declaring on national television that men can get pregnant and that some men have a uterus. And this is in some nod to the transgender movement. And uh, they, of course, claim that Christians are science deniers. But uh, to quote Copernicus, child, please, okay? Um, I'm pretty sure he said that. Uh, uh, so God made us, made us male and female. We embrace his design. And also our, our desire in this series is to shed on biblical notions of what it means to be male and female. And we did that in marriage, and we started talking about that last week in the church. Okay, at times the church has incorrectly placed limits or strict categories in marriage in the church that Scripture does not. And we've noted that along the way. Today I want to continue this study, male and female study, and talk about men and women in the church. And it's going to seem weird, but I'm going to get there, I promise, okay? And this is really going to be two parts. I was thinking I'd finish up the series today, but it's really going to be two parts. And so you're going to have to stick with me through all this today, and we'll wrap it up. It won't be next week, because next week we'll use Sunday, but we'll wrap it up here shortly, okay? Um, it's going to seem weird, but I'm going to talk about church leadership. We saw last week that God's design is for qualified men to lead the church as elders, okay? And I want to address that more fully today and also get to an area in the next sermon that we'd like to increase the opportunity for women in our church because we believe the Bible allows for that. So don't feel lost because we're talking about elders and then going to get to deacons. It'll make sense eventually, I hope. And if it doesn't, you can get your money back, okay? And I don't know how that would work, but I'll make that promise, okay? So Paul's intentions for this letter, 1 Timothy chapter 3, uh, we see his intentions for the entire letter. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So why does Paul write this book, this 1 Timothy, this letter? So that you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. To put it in simply, this is instruction for the church. That when the church gathers, this is what it should look like. The Bible has a lot to say about what a church should look like. It has a lot to say about how a church should be governed and what its leaders should be look like, and what its members should be doing and involved in. Okay, the Bible has a lot to say about that. The Bible also gives a lot of freedom for churches, okay? Um, but we can find a lot of that instruction in this letter in 1 Timothy. Already, and we didn't cover through most of this because we're not going through the book of 1 Timothy, but already Paul has covered false teachers and warning about them in the church, guarding the gospel in the church, the message, okay, but the, the, the heartbeat of Christianity, the prayer ministry of the church, the role of women in church. We talked about that last week. And now he moves on to qualifications for church leadership. So last week we talked about men and women in the church, and we talked in part about the idea of all of us submitting, putting ourselves in submission to church leadership, and that it's a voluntary submission. And in this chapter, Paul follows up with, this is what that church leadership should look like. And if it doesn't look like that, the leadership should change. And if the church won't change the leadership, then you should look for another church. Okay? So that's, that's what we see here. But the responsibility to find a local church, to place ourselves under the oversight, the care of spiritual elders, 
in deacons. It's very real and quite important. And the Bible encourages us over and over to do that. The Bible expects that to happen. The, the New Testament doesn't know Lone Ranger Christians, okay? So it's important, and Paul goes into great detail on what leadership should look like. The idea that you can do church by yourself is foreign to Scripture. Can you have fellowship with God apart from church? Yes. Can you worship God apart from church? Yes. But we are also, as believers, called to gather together in a local church and, and worship God together. A church that's striving towards being led by elders, that has deacons serving, a church that has members that are active and holding each other accountable. In all of that glorious mess, all of these sinners, all of us sinners under one roof, right? All that we can bring, the Bible still expects that. And entire books of the Bible are dedicated to what it should look like. And 1 Timothy is one of them. And here in chapter 3, he starts talking about leadership in the church. And how, how do we get here in this series? Because we're talking about men and women, male and female, right? Understanding the relationship in marriage, in the broader culture, and in the church. And look, if you get nothing else from this series, I want to convey the supremacy of Scripture to you. That here at the Dove, we are men and women of the book. We strive to be men and women of the book. And so the standard for truth is not like you seek your truth and I seek my truth. Don't get me wrong. We absolutely believe in the freedom to pursue what you want to pursue in religion, okay? But what we don't believe is that everybody's right. Okay? In fact, somebody's right and somebody's wrong. All right? um, we don't claim to have all the answers here. Okay, Not at all. But we do believe there's a standard for the truth, and that's the Bible. And so that's why we strive to be men and women of the book. And so when you and I, when we come across people who believe differently, the standard for whether it's true or not is not, man, they're really nice people. That is not the standard that makes what they believe true. The standard is not, well, they seem really sincere, okay? The standard is not, but they're my friend. They're so nice, and they love the Lord. All of those things can be true, but that doesn't mean that what they believe is true. The Bible is the standard, not our feelings about other people. You can believe something sincerely and be sincerely wrong, okay? And I say that again. You can believe something sincerely and be sincerely wrong. Nice people are wrong all the time. Okay, where I come from, we call them vegetarians, okay? Like really, really nice people, but just wrong, okay? How can you eat something with a face, Jason? Well, because that face tastes like bacon, okay? That's why I can do that. Are you judging vegetarians? No, not out loud, okay? We just secretly behind your back, like a good Christian. That's what we do, all right? In all seriousness, in all seriousness, the standard is always, what does the Bible say, okay? Not, I have a good friend and they sincerely believe differently than me. We celebrate their right to believe differently, but one of us is right and one of us is wrong. Truth is objective. There is a standard. The Bible is that standard because it's the breathed out word of God, okay? So the standard is, what does the Bible say? Does this match up with what we see in Scripture? And we're going to apply that standard to all the topics that we get to. But the church is God's institution. Paul says it's the household of God. And so God has every right to insist on proper conduct within his household. And we have the responsibility to do as he says, to obey. So the church at Ephesus, which is the church that, that Paul's addressing in this letter, uh, it's apparently a total mess. And it was a source of great trouble for its young pastor, Timothy. Timothy was like Paul's like son in the faith. And the problem in part was the church was being led by unqualified men. Unqualified elders were leading the church, and they were leading the church into sin. They were leading it away from sound doctrine, and if the leadership deviates from sound doctrine, if the leadership is lacking holiness, the entire household, that local household, is threatened and will most likely suffer severely because of it. All right, so all that to say, 1 Timothy 3, look at verse 1 with me, okay? Here's his instructions for leadership. Tying this into our series, male and female. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, 
respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, that he may not fall into disgrace into the snare of the devil. So let me just say, at the outset, it's important that we get this right. In many churches, follow more of a pastor as the CEO type of model, especially when you get into very large churches. Okay, the pastor kind of operates more like a Fortune 500 company, the chief executive officer. Okay, and so maybe you have pastor, then you have under him some associates, and then some deacons. And frankly, I don't believe that is the accurate model of what the Bible describes for church leadership. I'm going to show you why here in this text. There's a lot of abuse that can happen in that type of government, church government. Because if the pastor's the CEO, he, he, what he says goes, okay? And also sometimes then in that dynamic, then you view like the pastor's like the man of God in a way more than it's intended to where then like almost got like this papal authority, like he, what he says goes all the time. And then you, you have some unbiblical um, Examples from the Old Testament, like, or, or, or drawing in wrong, wrong conclusions, like, he's the Lord's anointed, and nobody's to touch the Lord's anointed, which is a, a very poor application of an Old Testament scripture that applies to Old Testament kings when David wouldn't lay a hand on Saul. That's not an application for the pastor. The pastor's not a king, okay? And so we want to get this right, and we want to be obedient to scripture. Okay? And just like we did last week, we'll look at this text specifically, and we're also going to consider the broader teaching of Scripture on this idea. So the first thing we see in verse 1 is that the church should be elder-led. Okay? The church should be elder-led. This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Now, some translations use the word bishop. You may have a translation that uses that. But what I want you to understand is that God has designed that his church should be led by qualified men. These men are to oversee the church. It's important to note that overseer and elder are not different offices. Okay? Some denominations, all right, they have, they have offices above that of the local church. Okay? And, um, but overseer and elder are used interchangeably. And you don't have to know, you don't have to know New Testament Greek to get that. Okay? It's, this is not some type of special position where you have an elder and then you have an overseer that oversees this church or several churches, okay, um, like maybe you would see in the Roman Catholic Church. I'll give you another example where you can see what I'm talking about. Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Here you'll see overseer and elders used interchangeably. So when I'm telling you that the Bible uses elders and pastor and bishop and shepherd and overseer, it's all the same thing. So here's this example. This is why, here's Paul writing, I left you in Crete so that you might put what, the remained, what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, his children are believers, not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. So here again is another passage where Paul's listing the qualifications for church leadership. And this time he uses the word elder, and then he switches to overseer. They're used interchangeably in Scripture. They're the exact same office. So the church is to be led by elders, overseers, okay, men who meet the qualifications that he lists in Scripture. And there should be a plurality of those elders. This is why we, we don't here just have, like, the pastor, like, I'm the man up here, okay, above everybody else. The church is led by elders. I am one of five elders, okay? And the Bible, I believe, teaches that, and you're seeing it here, okay? More than one elder, multiple elders. It's a separate role from that of deacons. We'll talk about deacons next time, okay? More on that in the coming weeks. But in chapter 3, verse 1, overseer, it's singular because he's speaking of the office. But we know for a fact that the very church that Paul is writing to here was a church that had multiple elders leading it, okay? And I'll show you that. Acts chapter 20, we'll put it on the screen. Okay? Now from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and he called the elders of the church to come to him. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. 
to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. A great, great line there for all of us. It ain't my church, it ain't your church. It's his church. He bought it with his own blood, right? Great for all of us to remember. Great for us as leaders to remember that as well, okay? He obtained it with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. So this is the church at Ephesus. It's a church that's led by a group of elders. They were tasked with overseeing the church, multiple overseers spiritually leading the church, protecting the flock. Titus chapter 1, uh, Paul tells, uh, tells them to appoint elders in every town, okay? And don't think when you read that, like think of our modern version, like the Bible Belt version, there's elders in every town, so that means there was a single pastor of the Baptist church, there's a single pastor of the Bible church, a single pastor of the Methodist church, okay? Think one church in each of these towns. And their desire was to raise up, to disciple multiple spiritually qualified men to lead that church, okay? Uh, also, one more example, uh, in Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. Okay, and I'm just doing this, and I realize this is a little, like, heavier today, but it's important for us, okay? I'm doing this to show you that Paul shows that there are two offices in the church, overseers and elders and deacons. Both are plural. In other words, there should be more than one, okay? There will be times, like in a church start or a church plant, where maybe there's only one elder, or there's not even a single elder, and we're working towards it, okay? But in the beginning, maybe there'll be one, but the focus should be on working towards a group of spiritually qualified men to lead the church. Acts chapter 20, Titus chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 5, I exhort the elders, Philippians chapter 1, they're all examples. And why, do, why does the Bible do this? Because the spiritual load is great. And watching and caring for the flock is to be a group effort. The group being qualified men. These elders are to labor in the preaching and teaching of the word. It doesn't mean that they all have to teach equally. It doesn't mean that you can't have a one designated teacher. But their responsibility is the oversight, the spiritual oversight of the church. Okay? It's a noble task. A task worthy of a life's calling, a task that demands sacrifice and hardship and can cause many sleepless nights, but it's a noble task. Desire is not enough, like, hey, I want to be a pastor, I want to be an elder. Paul says there, that you must be qualified. And by God's grace, we want to continue to create an atmosphere here at this church where God will raise up men within this church to lead this church and even other churches to shepherd and to oversee here and elsewhere. And realize the reality of the role, but also see the noble task. This church, our church, is to be led by qualified elders, okay? Here's the second thing. But the church is governed by the members, okay? The church is governed by the members, okay? So elder-led, but like another way to put it is congregational rule, okay? The members govern the church. Paul is not giving unquestioned authority to the elders, so any church that says that or demands that is not a healthy church, okay? Any leadership that says that, okay? In fact, in multiple places in the New Testament, we see that the congregation has the final say in a church decision, okay? We don't see it here, and this is what I was talking about when we pull from other places in the Scripture, in many other places. And we have tried to increase that role of our congregation, our membership, here the last few years. We do that in our Dove Connections, We'll have one coming up here in about three or four weeks. Because as members, you play a crucial role in the church. Okay? You help keep the elders accountable. You help make decisions in the church. Yes, the elders are designed by God to lead. And we're submitting ourselves to the leadership, the spiritual oversight of the elders. But that doesn't mean that we are mindless drones. God desires that the members help govern the church. Okay? Um, you don't see the word membership in the New Testament but you see it practiced in multiple places. In Acts chapter 2, we're told that those who were saved and baptized were added to the church. That the early in the church, they had a way of distinguishing those who were within the church and those who were without the church. Those who were committed part of that body and those who were onlookers, okay? So we don't have the word membership, but we see it practiced in Acts chapter 2. I'll give you another one. We'll put it on the screen. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. This is an issue of church discipline, okay? And Paul is actually telling the church, he's recommending 
this brother that they've disciplined, he's saying restore them into membership. Membership isn't the word used there, but you can see it and you can see what he's talking about. If anyone has caused pain, he's caused it not to me, but in some measure, measure not to put it too severely to all of you. For such a one, this person that's caused this pain, who's been disciplined, right? The punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive him and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. We're not going to unpack, uh, unpack all of that text. We have here a brother that's been disciplined, but he's apparently repentant. And some of the people are like, we got to just keep giving it to him. We got to just keep grinding his face into the dirt. And Paul's like, no, it's time to stop. It's time to bring him back in. And it's interesting how he says the church should decide to bring him back in, right? What does he say here? The he references the majority, okay? The majority of what? Everybody who walked off the street that day got to have a decision and, and whether this brother should be disciplined and whether this brother should be restored. This is church membership in its early form. It's the majority of the membership of the church at Corinth. Another example is Matthew chapter 18, and we won't turn there. But the final step in church discipline in Matthew chapter 18 that Jesus outlines is for the offender who refuses to repent of his sin, the final step is to bring him before the church. Again, anybody that walks off the street gets to have a say in the spiritual decision making? Absolutely not. The Bible understands the idea of a church that is governed by its members, and that is equally male and female. It's not like the, the male members have more of a say in that. No, the, the male and female members are to, to govern the church, okay? And they have a responsibility to discipline and to restore equally. The congregation, male and female, called upon to act as accountability to each other, to, to the elders. Are you called to submit to church leadership? Yes, but it's a voluntary submission, and it should be to biblical leadership. And if it's not, remove that leadership. And if that leadership won't remove or be removed, then move yourself to another church in a healthy way. But when you join a local church, you submit to the care, the authority, the accountability of the local church leadership, right? Your salvation is on record to when you join a church. We hold each other accountable, right? So God desires that, that qualified spiritual men would oversee the church and that the church then would be governed by church members, okay? Here's the third thing, and we're not going to get through all of this today, okay? Here's the third thing, that elders should be male. We talked about this at length last week. Again, I encourage you to listen to it, but it's emphasized in a couple of different ways. First of all, he talks about being the husband of one wife. So obviously, the, the author's already talking about assuming that this elder is a male. And then also, we have the masculine pronouns throughout the entire text. He must, he must, okay? We talked about this last week. I won't go into great detail today. If you have questions, send me a question on email, dovechurchpastor at gmail. Send me a text, all right? Write it down in the connect card, put it in the offering, and we'll, we'll answer them, okay? Also, go listen to part three. But when the church is gathered, the public teaching should be carried out by men. And we talked about last week how were we as the, the church, uh, as elders, where we see that is in the morning service. Do we believe that women should teach the word, that they can lead a life group with men and women in it, even teach a possible Sunday school class with men and women in it? Yes, we believe that, okay? But when the church is gathered for the morning service, it should be taught by qualified men. So the public preaching ministry is prohibited for women if we follow the qualifications in Scripture. The elders are appointed by male and female members, though. The male and female members are the ones who vote in these elders. When I, when I came here as a pastor three and a half years ago, Men and women in this church listened to me, interviewed me, decided together to vote and to allow me to lead the church as one of the elders. You do that equally as men and women, okay? Um, to have the spiritual oversight of the church. It's not unquestioned, but it were trusted to lead. And the restriction here is in regards to the public teaching of the word when the church is gathered. There are many qualifications that Paul lists, that the Bible lists for leadership in the church. But one of those qualifications is that the church is to be led in that elder role by men. This is a far cry from women have no place in the church. In fact, women have an invaluable role in the church. And we talked about this at length last week. And the Bible calls you, you women, to know the word, to, to disciple, to pray, right, to sing, right, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to, to all of us, not just uh, women to women and men to men. 
we all have this responsibility. But public teaching and the spiritual oversight of the church is reserved for certain qualified men. Here's the next thing. An elder must be faithful at home. Faithful at home. The, the husband of one wife, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? According to Paul, if you want, one of the ways you find out whether or not a man is fit for the office of elder is you get a glimpse at his home life. That's what Paul says. You get a glimpse at his home life. Is he the husband of one wife? In other words, is he faithful to his marriage vows? Some translations have that, is he a one-woman man? And that probably best conveys the sense that Paul's getting at. One um, could certainly um, be married to only one woman, yet have a woman on the side, or have multiple women on the side. It's quite common, right, in, in many areas. It's quite common in the political arena where marriages are maintained solely for the political reasons. But the senator, the governor, the president is anything but a one-woman one man. If there is any doubt, this also reveals God's uh, views against polygamy. People often incorrectly say that God's fine with polygamy. But that's not the case here, right? The polygamy is a perverting of marriage, just like all the other perversions of marriage. So David was king, but David would not be qualified to be an elder because of all his wives. Solomon was the wisest man to ever live, but he had upwards of a thousand wives. I don't know what he did when Coles had a sale, but he, was, he had upwards of a thousand wives, okay? And he is not qualified to be an elder. So, so this is like unmitigated direction here by God, okay, condemning polygamy, that it's a perversion of marriage. And so, and envision this, envision this for missionaries reaching new tribes and seeing the gospel work. And, and starting a new church, and having the village elder, who because of his wealth has multiple wives, and he comes to Christ, and he is the elder of the entire village, but he's not fit to be an elder of the church started within that village. Imagine that dynamic, right? So that's what's happening here, okay? But, but out in the business world, out in the political world, the leader's home life is supposedly off limits. What he does, what she does at home, what he does, what she does in the bedroom is off limits, and it's not supposed to have an effect on their fitness for office, but the Bible kind of sees that differently, right? One of the worst examples of this type of thinking was in the primaries leading up to the 2012 presidential election. An opinion piece on a major news site was titled, Newt, speaking of Newt Gingrich's, his three marriages mean he might make a strong president. And listen to this author's reasoning for this. Three women have met Mr. Gingrich and have been so moved by his emotional energy and intellect that they decided they wanted to spend the rest of their lives with him. Two of these women felt this way even though he was already married. And so this author, to, to their shame, is saying this is a positive about Mr. Gingrich. And he concludes with this, when the three women want to sign on for life with a man who is now running for president, I worry more about whether we'll be clamoring for a third Gingrich term, not whether we'll want him to let him go after one. And we say that to our great shame as a culture, that this is to be valued. God doesn't value that. And it's any wonder why our nation is in such trouble. Marital infidelity is a positive. Not so, not so, though, in God's eyes, whether that's in the political world, the business world, or especially in the church. As one writer says, how you handle your bride as an elder matters very much if you would care for Christ's bride. That's what Paul's saying. So if, an el if a man is to be an elder in the church, he is to truly be a one-woman man. There is no doubt by his wife or those close to them that his devotion to his wife is to her and to her alone. Now look at verse 5. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? So this is interesting because the early church met in homes, right? They met in homes, and there was no hiding your family. So Paul is not calling for perfection by the part of the elders. He's not calling for a higher standard for the children of the elders, but he's saying Watch how, if that man would desire that office, or you're considering making him an elder in your church, watch how he manages and leads his house in blessing and in trial, because there's going to be blessing and trial in the church, in peace and in turmoil, 
Because there's also, just like there's peace and turmoil in the home, there's peace and turmoil in the church, in obedience and in sin. Because just like there's obedience and sin in the home, there's obedience and sin in the church. An elder's family might have prodigals. How does he pursue his prodigal? Because the church has prodigals. And that's going to give you a great insight on how the elder pursues prodigals in the church. An elder's family will sin. The elder will sin. How does he lead them in repentance and restoration? Because that's the kind of things that are going to happen in church as well. And the man who is failing to manage his own house is not fit, at least for a time, to manage the household of God. So Paul says elders must be faithful at home. Now look, that's a good stopping point today. We're going to get back to this here in a couple weeks. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm making the case we're going through elders and then we're going to deacons. I'm going to make the case for you for why I believe we should expand the role of deacons to deaconesses. We've talked about this as elders a lot. And I'm going to show you from the text here, right, why I believe that's the case, okay? And so that's where we're going with this. And that will happen here by God's grace in a couple weeks. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we want to be men and women of the book here. And so we pray for grace to, to follow your word. Lord, we pray that you would empower us through the spirit to walk worthy, Lord, to walk humbly, to walk together. I thank you for the, the great group of men and women, Lord, that you have gathered at the church here. What a privilege it is to be one of the elders here leading. We thank you for that grace, Lord. And we thank you for the, the, the desire and the passion to reach our community. To, to gather together to work as a church, Lord, to grow and to, to spread your word. And we pray for grace to continue to do that. We pray, Lord, as elders, that you would grant us grace to lead humbly, to lead mercifully, Lord, to be quick to restore and quick to repent ourselves, to model that. Lord, we pray. So as the instruments play, here's your time to speak with God. And maybe you're here and you're not a Christian. And so that's your prayer. Father, be merciful to me, a sinner, and save me today. And you can receive that salvation for me free. Maybe you're here and, and God's showing you, convicting you about your role and your involvement in the church. And God's spurring you to greater involvement. And acknowledge that in prayer today. And commit to that and make a decision to take next steps. As the instruments play, here's your time to speak with God. Thank you.